Ah, melting point. One of those tests that you will use over and over and over and over throughout the entire program, and one of those tests that you will probably experience on a daily basis once you become employed in the field. So melting point is a very, very common test that we do in the laboratory to help prove that a compound is what it says that it is. So melting point, you're going to go to come friends with. With melting point, you're going to have a love-hate relationship with. But I will tell you that melting point analysis now is much better than what it used to be back in the day because now we've got instrumentation that will allow us to do the melting point within a matter of seconds versus all of the nasty glassware and reagents that we have to bring in in order to do it by hand. But guess what? We're going to make you suffer because that's what I'm in the business of doing. I want to make you suffer, right? So what we want you to do is experience the way that melting point used to be done and then we want to kind of turn your direction toward how melting point is done today in an analytical environment. So this video and this discussion, it's really going to kind of test my artistic ability because we're going to first draw the hand form of how you should be doing a melting point. So first off, what you need to pick out is a capillary tube. Okay, so the capillary tube, what is it? Well, we order capillary tubes that are opened on one end and closed on the other because we don't want to go through the problem of doing the capillary closed in on our own every single time that we need to use it. So we spend a little bit of extra money and we order these capillary tubes that are closed on one end and then they're opened up on the top. Okay, so imagine them being a really, 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 really tiny slender test tube. That is a capillary tube. They use them for a number of purposes. Biology has a different purpose than we have them and that what we use them for, but the same deal. It is a capillary tube. It's glass, it is very thin, and it is closed on one end. So first off, when you go and get the capillary tubes for the hand measurement or for the melting point measurement, you need to make sure that they are closed on one end. Because if they are not, you are using the wrong ones. You are using capillary tubes that are meant for another purpose. And we do not want you to use those. That is not the uh, correct piece of glassware, really, that we should be using for this lab. Okay, so what's going to happen is that I'm going to take this capillary tube and then I'm going to have just this solid lump of crystal that is an unknown. I don't know what it is, and that's the purpose of the lab. It's for you to figure out what that unknown is. So what we want you to do is take some of these crystals, and we want you to put some of these crystals into the capillary tube. And the only thing that I will tell you at this point is good luck, because you'll need it. What will happen in this capillary tube is that it's so narrow that it's going to be very difficult to pack some of the crystals into the capillary tube. And what you want is a good maybe centimeter of crystals here in the very bottom of the capillary tube. So the proper way is less is more, and that is very fitting for packing a capillary tube. So you want to invert the capillary tube upside down with the open end pointed downward. And then you're just going to kind of tap this solid with the capillary tube. And then some of these crystals will get stuck in the very top. And then you're going to take your fingers and you're going to flick the top end of the capillary tube. And what you'll see is that from that point, all of these crystals will kind of trickle down and go to the very bottom. So that's the proper way of packing a capillary tube. Once my capillary tube is packed, so here's my capillary tube with my green stuff in the bottom, I'm then going to attach that to a thermometer. 
So the bottom end of the thermometer should basically be where this solid is going to be located. And then I'm going to have a taller thermometer that kind of comes up this way. And there's tick marks all up and down it, right? So I can read the temperature at which this stuff is going to melt. And I'm going to have to attach these. And I'm going to attach these through an elastic band. So we'll give you an elastic band that will just kind of keep these two things together so they don't slide around and they don't fall apart on you. Okay, so once you get your thermometer and once you get your capillary tube ready, packed, and proper, for the melting point analysis. We are then going to stick this whole contraption down into another container. So this is going to go into another piece of glassware. And the glassware will look something like this. It will be kind of fat, uh, big walled, and then there will kind of be an elbow that will come out this way that will kind of make this joint we call this a fill tube, T-H-E-I-L-E, -E, fill tube. And the fill tube is the proper piece of glassware that we use to make a hand melting point analysis. Now, the lab is going to tell you to use a beaker. But we do not use a beaker in this case because a beaker doesn't really circulate the oil that we will eventually put into the field tube. It doesn't have a way to circulate at all, period. So the melting point will be kind of off. So we have these special pieces of glassware that we call field tubes, and field tubes are used for that purpose. So what will happen is that we will fill the field tube up with oil all the way to cover your crystals in this capillary tube and to cover the end of the thermometer. It will be filled with mineral oil. That is what's going to go in to the actual field tube itself. And then we're going to take this whole setup and we're going to clamp it down. So we're going to clamp it onto a really tall ring stand. And then right below, we're going to have a Bunsen burner that will eventually heat up this fill tube that's holding the oil that I need to heat up. Now, the problem is that heat, oil, heat, and oil are bad news because that means I'm getting ready to cook a french fry. And I don't want my fingers, and I don't want my face, and I don't want my arms or my forearms to be covered in hot grease right so you want to be very careful when you heat the field tube up you are heating a really hot oil to a really hot temperature and you don't want this stuff to break or to splatter all over the place because somebody is going to be screaming and I know it's not going to be me I don't want it to be me I don't want it to be you either but somebody is not gonna have a very nice time in the lab that afternoon if they get hot oil splattered all over their face so second I'm gonna come up here to the top and I'm gonna put glasses you want to make sure that you wear your safety glasses. It's oil, I know. And what we give you is not very dangerous. It's something that you're exposed to typically without any health hazard at all. But we want to wear the safety glasses because of the hot oil incident that could happen, especially if there's a crack or a star in the field tube and you don't see it. And this heat can actually just blow the whole thing up and shatter it into pieces. So this is something that you want to kind of... Um, pay attention to, make sure that you understand uh, the danger of the hot oil in the field tube itself. All right, so we're going to heat this stuff up. This is a mineral oil base. It's going to heat, 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 heat. And what will happen is that the thermometer will keep in touch with the mineral oil. So this thermometer will give me my temperature read that I need for the lab. Okay. So what will happen is that I will keep my eye on this piece of the puzzle. I want to keep my eye on the crystal. And as long as I can see the crystal and it's solid, we have not reached the melting point yet. So I'm going to continue to heat. 
And my advice is to get your Bunsen burner and kind of go back and forth of the bottom. Don't just heat in one spot. You create a hot spot. So if you go back and forth with the Bunsen burner, what you will allow to happen is this mineral oil to kind of circulate in the field tube and we constantly get a circulating oil bath. That way we don't create hot spots. There's not certain parts of the field tube that are a little hotter than the others. So I'm going to keep my eye on the crystals. And when I keep my eye on the crystals, well, when they begin to melt and when I visually see them to melt, that is my melting point temperature. So look for these things to melt. As soon as you see these crystals melt, they will hopefully happen all at once. They won't be a span of, you know, 5, 10 degrees. It will happen all at one time. And when those crystals melt, this is your melting temperature that you can abbreviate as T sub M or M sub T, melting temperature or melting point. That is what we're after. Some people, like myself, use MP for the melting point abbreviation. So I will then take a look at the melting point. And I'll look at the list that's given in the lab. So what kind of compounds are given? Well, let's play kind of uh, kindergarten for a minute and go through our alphabet of possibilities. So up at the top, we have benzophenone that has a melting point of 48 to 50 degrees. Then we have bibenzyl, which has a melting point of 50 to 51. Six chlorothymol, which is 58 to 59. Palmitic acid, which is 61 to 63. Acetamide, which is 79 to 81. Vanillin, which is 81 to 83. D.L. Mandelic acid, which is 119 to 121. Benzoic acid, which is 121 to 122. Transcinamic acid, which is 133 to 135. Cholesterol, which is 144 to 146. And aranthanilic acid, which is 146 to 148. These are the choices that you have that your unknown could be. And not everyone will have the same unknown. So if you get a different melting point than somebody else, then that's okay. Not everyone will have the same one. So you're going to compare your melting point to one of these. Where does it come closer? Because whichever one it comes closer to is probably your actual compound that's your unknown. Now the problem is that if we go up here to benzophenone and we look at that, that's 48 to 50. And then we take a look at bibenzyl, which is 50 to 51. You might have a hard time in the beginning to kind of distinguish the difference between a couple of these, which is the purpose of the data sheet. So on the data sheet, it will have an unknown number. So you're going to provide your unknown number here, whatever that is. Let's say mine is A. The melting point says first attempt. Okay, so on the first attempt, you're going to record the melting point. I've got a 50. And then down below, it says substances to consider. So this is going to want you to put more than one. That's why it says substance says and not substance. There is an S after that, people. So you want to write down the choices that it could possibly be, at least two of them. So what I would write down here would be, okay, well, this could be benzophenone or it could be by benzyl. I don't know really which one it is, but this is me narrowing down the choices into something that's a little bit more workable. And then down below it says, okay, do the unknown number, do the melting point again, do the name of the compound, and tell us why you think you pick the compound that is correct. So you're going to do this two times. So over here to the side, I'm going to put two times because you're going to heat, see when it melts, write down the temperature, give me the choices. Let this cool before the second attempt. 
Now, does it have to be completely room temperature? No, of course not. But it's got to be below 40 degrees and the reason that I say it's got to be below 45 degrees is because this is the temperature at which your melting point kind of started now what if my melting point happened at a hundred do I have to go all the way down to 45 the answer is no you do not have to go to 45 if your crystals melted at a hundred go down to like 70 or 80 degrees and then put your crystals back into the field tube and start the heating process all over again again. You do not have to go all the way down to 45 degrees. But some of you will have compounds that will melt around the 50 degree range or the 55 degree range. And if you do, then you want that to cool down to at least 45 or 40, somewhere in there, before you do the second attempt. All right, so that's all that the melting point contraption is, right? We've got a capillary tube. We fill it full of solid. We attach it to a thermometer. We put that into a field tube, and we slowly heat it up. And that's as simple as the lab is going to be, people. So uh, the only thing you've got to do, again, two melting points. Uh, however, there is a second part to this lab because this is just the hand portion. We are then going to talk about the instrumentation portion in the next video. So you will have another round of melting point uh, that you will be able to perform. And in the part two, we'll talk about the instrument and how it works.